السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته to everyone wherever you are whenever you are I wish that Allah سبحانه وتعالى protecting you and making your life easy for yourself and your community Today you will be talking about a subject which is connecting Corona virus to religion as well as to what I mentioned, Princess Aziza. People might think, what is the relationship between Corona virus, religion, and Princess Aziza? Let us go through this discussion with yourself and find out what is such relationship between the three of them. I base my discussion with you on nine points. Nine points. Point, Point number, number one, one is COVID-19 a pandemic? Point, Point number two, what is the relationship between COVID-19 hunger Point number three, will we be hit again by another COVID-19 next autumn? Point number four, are we ready for this attack by COVID in autumn? Point number five, why all this panic attack from COVID-19 and there's no such panic attack from hunger and the other killer diseases which claim the life of millions every year? Point number six, how much that those some Muslim religious leaders in the authorities dealt with COVID-19. Number seven, what are the impact of the arbitrary measures taken by such these few religious leaders on the social divide in their countries. Point number eight, which is Princess Aziza and COVID-19. Point number nine is what is the solution. These are the nine points which I will discuss with you so you can bear with me, inshallah. Coronavirus, is it a pandemic or not? Is it true reality or is it a conspiracy theory? Coming back to look at the numbers, of affected people over the last seven, eight months, 7.5 million. Looking at the number of deaths, which is more than 420,000 people, 5.6% of the affected people. Look at the number of the people who have been cured from actually uh, coronavirus, it's about 3.5 million, it's about 49%. This give us the result that it is true. It is not actually fake. On the other side, which you can look at, the drama, the series, the researches which came out before 2020, talking about coronavirus. One of which was an American drama, I hope that you have the link of it, which talks about, this was more than 15 years ago, talked about uh, corona as a virus coming from China, transferred by animals. We need to have social distances. We need to wear masks. And even they mention how to treat it with chloroquine, which is the anti-malaria drugs. This was mentioned in one of the American drama series. For more than 15 years ago, maybe the, the scientific knowledge and the uh, the scientific imagination of the producers might not rise to this level unless there are some facts. So this is the first point. Second point is there any relation between coronavirus, COVID-19, hunger, and other diseases? Let us talk and take you to this journey. As I mentioned, the numbers that COVID-19 claimed an infection, death, and cure in the previous point, now I will take you to another point which is talking about the number of people affected by hunger. As World Food Program mentioned it in 2018, 
820 million people globally affected by hunger. Every second there's one individual die, as well as annually more than 35, 36 million people dying. When we look at the world meter information to look at the population on earth, number of people living on earth, number of people born, dying every year and every second and every day. Yesterday I was looking at it to find at 11, at 145, 1345 on 30th of the June 2020, the number of people living on this planet is 7.794 billion people. This number one. Number of newly born people in this time at 1345, 30th of June 2020 was 69,671,200 and 200 from January till the 30th of June, 13.45 p.m. Number of dead people on such a day, which is 30 June 2020 at by 13.45 is 92,350 people. Number of dead people in this year from January till the 30th of June 2020 at 11, uh, sorry, at 13.44 is 29,249,730. So this gives us an indicator of how many people are living on the universe, how many people are dying, and how people are born every second and every day. Okay? Let us move out from the population and the death to the number of people dying every year from different diseases. Uh, September 2011, World Health Organization mentioned that actually 9.1 million people are dying from cancer in 2018. Cancer, all different kinds of cancers. Not actually the 400,000 people plus who died from Corona over the last seven or eight months. Let us move from cancer to malaria. And the International Day of Malaria in 2018, also World Health Organization said that the number of people affected or affected by malaria was 216 million. 192 of them are in Africa, which constitute Eight, nearly 89% of the people affected by malaria are African. In 2016, 445,000 of them died. This is malaria, cancer, and now we move to AIDS, HIV AIDS. On the International Day of AIDS, 30-11-2019, World Health Organization again and MSF, Medicine Sans Frontier, mentioned that the number of people infected by HIV AIDS are 37.9 million. This was mentioned last year. In 2018, 1.7 million of new cases of HIV AIDS are being reported. MSF, Medicine Sans Frontier, mentioned that actually in 2018, 770,000 people died from HIV AIDS. So this is AIDS, malaria, as well as uh, cancer. Heart diseases. According to WHO, again, World Health Organization, 2017, 17, 5, 17 of May 2017, they mentioned that 17.7 million people died from heart condition, heart diseases, in 2015. Constitute 31% of the total death in the universe in 2015. Moving from malaria, cancer, AIDS, and uh, heart diseases into measles. World Health Organization again on 5th of December 2019 mentioned that the people died from uh, measles between 2015 to 2020, about 20.3 million people. The last but not least, also WHO, World Health Organization 13, 12, 2017 mentioned 
that the number of people died from influenza or from flu actually 650,000. So when we put COVID on one side and we put hunger and other different killer diseases on one side, we find that the killer diseases plus hunger are claiming more, more, more lives than COVID-19 as we speak. Now, the point number three, are we going to be hit again by COVID-19 during autumn, which is September, October, November? Uh, there was a statement made by Sir Patrick uh, Valance, which is the chief scientific advisor to the British government. On 13 of March 2020, in express.co.uk, he said that uh, coronavirus could bounce back more aggressively in the autumn if attempts to attack the deadly virus become too hard at the wrong time. Not only that, there's another article by the Russian in TASS, 13 April 2020, TASS, said it is very unlikely that the virus will leave us alone, will be leaving us. This is done by the chief of the clinical research department of the Central Institute of Epidemiology under the Russian consumer right, rights watchdog. The third article by In Sample and Nicola Davis on 22nd of May 2020 in the Guardian.com, who said, well, COVID-19 mutate, yani become in a different form, into a more dangerous virus. There are concerns that it will mutate into a form that is more transmissible, more dangerous, or both potentially making uh, the global health crisis even worse. So from the Guardian to TASS to the Express people are saying that the possibility of having another attack of coronavirus in 2020 in autumn. Point number four in my discussion with you, are we ready for this attack? Are we ready socially, economically, uh, politically, uh, morally? Are we taking all these measures or not? Will this attack, the second attack, if the virus mutilated or come back again, will bring a lot of states and countries into their knees and let somebody, some of these states to vanish or not? This is something which we need to discuss. We need to discuss as well. All right, was actually the expectation of the virus and are we ready to deal with it or not? But let me take you to point number five, which mentioned is why all these panic attacks from COVID-19 and there's no much panic attack from other diseases such as cancer, HIV AIDS, malaria, uh, heart diseases as well as hunger. Could this mean because in the case of hunger, it's mainly affecting the lives of the poor, the weak, and the vulnerable. While in the case of COVID-19, is affecting the wealthy, the strong, and the affluent. So it does come to you, knock your doors, to tell you, wake up, I'm coming to uh, hit you, whether you are rich or poor, strong or weak, uh, healthy or unhealthy. This is one point. Another part of the conspiracy theory, which is in point number five, is if there's any, any direction by certain countries to frighten nations, to frighten states, and to frighten people, To make them having this panic attack from COVID, mutilation, uh, another attack, and others. I'm not saying that I believe in it, but let us discuss it and try to understand 
what's behind all these panic attacks to come to all of us. It could be organized by certain countries to try to change such nations from a nation into clusters of people, from clusters of people into smaller groups of people, from smaller groups of people into individuals. So they'll be disconnected, they don't have values, they don't have culture, they don't have history, they don't have aspiration, and they be used actually by different systems. They become absolutely become consumer, not producers. This is a part of the conspiracy theory as well. So it's between the reality of Corona and the panic attack and actually the, the conspiracy theory. This is number five. Let us go to what we are talking about today, which is the behavior of certain religious people in certain Muslim countries. I thank them because they take all the precautionary measures to protect the nation by doing the following. Closing down mosques, especially the Muslims, closing down mosques, stopping uh, the ritual uh, uh, worshipping such as going for Umrah to visit the holy places in Mecca, Medina, going to make Hajj, as you can see it nowadays, there's no Hajj this year, uh, no much uh, congregation in the mosques over the last maybe four months. Uh, no much religious festivity during Ramadan or after Ramadan or before Ramadan. No congregation to learn inside the mosque or somebody else the religious education. That's fine if this applies to every organization and to every sector in the society and in the country. But on the contrary, insists uh, the same Muslim countries where those zealous uh, emotionally excited so-called some religious leaders were trying to affirm the arbitrary measures on the public in the same countries during and before Ramadan and after Ramadan they're still filming editing producing dramas TV shows where the superstar and the stars and the technician and the producers and the directors are in very small rooms with, any, with no social distances and no masks to protect them. So double standard. We will find their markets is full of people who are actually uh, either salesmen or saleswomen or consumers. We will find that the public transport was full of people with no social distances or no measures at all, including wearing the masks. Will you find there's no, no, no law to enforce the social distances and the mask wearing in these countries? Will you find that such government, who are actually with one hand, was actually closing the mosques, on the other hand, allowing the private business to carry on building, building the mega, the mega construction projects in their countries? with no measures taken. We will find that in such countries, they were actually still receiving a lot of uh, tourist uh, groups coming with no quarantine for them. And this is some of what we can see that such religious authority in such countries were actually having double standard. Only on the mosque, even not to the churches, Churches were not treating the same like the mosques. Even some of such called religious leaders were trying to allow people to break the fast before Ramadan entered a few months ago. So when we look at all this, and when we look at now, Alhamdulillah, that a lot of countries are opening up to make the normal life Come to make the site come back to their normal life again and again and again. Where we will find the cinemas are open, the theaters are open, uh, markets are open, uh, malls are open, uh, what they call it, cafeteria, restaurant, and extra, extra are open. But the mosques are not open yet for Friday prayer. Some of them opened, yani, 
the mosques for just the other prayer time like Zuhr, Asr, and Maghrib, and Asha, but not for Friday prayer yet in some of these countries who have this kind of double standard. So point number seven in my discussion with you is, so we have seen the arbitrary measure which is taken by uh, the so-called authorities in these countries. Now we are talking about what are the impacts of these arbitrary measures on the social divide in the society. This is where I'm coming to you. And I hope that my discussion on these six or seven points is wrong. I hope that I am wrong, inshallah. The impact of having these arbitrary measures only on the mosques, only on Muslims, will lead to social divide into two parts. One part will be called, that the people will be calling this group, we will call them the biological citizen. Two groups in the society, one of them will call the biological group of biological citizen, and the other one will be divided into smaller, six smaller groups. What do you mean by a biological uh, group or biological citizens? Citizens who are only interested in fulfillment of their biological needs, food, drink, clothing, housing, uh, uh, matrimonial relationship with their wives or sexual activities with whatever you call it in this area, something which they need, the biological needs of them. They have nothing to do with the society and they have nothing to do with what's happening in the society. This constitutes about 50 to 60 percent of most of the society, especially in what we call the third world countries and particularly the Arab uh, countries. The other group will be divided into six, six smaller groups. Group number one will be proactive, who will be proactively try to educate themselves in what? In religious, teaching, in uh, history, in uh, social life, in technology, in everything. So those people, proactive group will be actually educating themselves. This is the proactive group, educating itself. Second group will be calling it the joining group. Some people don't have the time to be proactive, but they can join a good, credible group discussion on the social media, whether it's on the theology, on the religion, on the social life, on cooking, on whatever you call it, on politics and economy and history, or whatever you call this one. This is the joining group. The third group will call it actually the affected group. What do you mean by affected group? Affected group would be affected by depression, becoming isolationists, isolating themselves from others, and becoming withdrawn from the society as a symptom of mistrust to the authority who, whom they have seen it dealing with uh, the religion in a different way than actually dealing with other religion or the world, other uh, institution. Group number four, it, we call it the transformed group. And you talked about the, uh, the affected group, then the transformed group. What do you mean transformed group? Those people will be transformed into becoming radical extremist. Radical and extremist, unfortunately. You're going one by one. Group number five will be the polarized group where those young people will be polarizing their activity and be picked up by groups which can use them and abuse them in unlawful sexual activities and the others through the social media and the uh, communication with them. Number six, which is the most dangerous, is the recruitment group. The recruitment group will come from such organized terrorist groups which will be able to recruit those, those hot-headed young individuals and recruit them. Unfortunately, this will happen 
because of this irresponsible individual are trying to tighten the space of freedom and the freedom space on the society and particularly on the Muslim institution and Muslim themselves. So let me take you to mention some of the diseases will affect these uh, societies is extremism, radicalism, is isolation, alienation, depression, social divide, then social uh, social uh, what they call it uh, violence and from social violence we go to the terrorist activities among the very 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 few young people i hope i hope that my analysis could be wrong i hope that my analysis could be wrong i hope that my analysis could be wrong moving from point number seven which is the impact of the arbitrary measures taken by such religious leaders in so-called muslim religion, muslim majority countries into actually the Prince Aziza theology or philosophy. Prince Aziza was a movie uh, made in 1961 in Egypt. Talk about a young beautiful girl. Her brother was a butcher and he was very bad, selling bad meat, treating the tenants in his house very badly and threatening everybody in the uh, avenue. And the star of the movie came and rented the flat next to next door to the flat of this butcher and his uh, sister, uh, which called it Princess Aziza. So one of his colleagues in the in the school, because he was a teacher, was a tenant to, to this house before, and he realized that actually his, his his colleague who actually rented the flat being fooled by this butcher. So he was trying to convince him to call the police. To arrest him because he's selling bad meat in his shop. So they came to the avenue, the police forces came in a uniform, plain uniform. Then the butcher was very intelligent. He realized that actually the ex tenant came with the current tenant. And they started to look what's going on. Something is fishy going on. Then he looked at the cafeteria and found quite few strange faces in a plain uniform. So he pecked it like this to, rise, to, to realize that this is some of the security forces or police forces in a plain uniform. So you know what he did as an intelligent man? He called his boys to create a chaos in the avenue and create a fight. So you can go up to the flat and kill the man who brought the police to the avenue. In a nutshell, the moral story of this movie is, is Corona becoming a camouflage to what could be happening to countries, to societies, to regions of changing the demography, changing the geography, letting people, countries to disappear or maybe merge with one another, particularly in the area of the Middle East because where most of the people are focusing their attention on it. So I'm still between the corona as a reality and true and the corona as a conspiracy theory. So this is Princess Aziza movie which I use the philosophy of the movie to try to see if we're going to be fooled again actually by what's happening when we corona, corona uh, pandemic will disappear and we'll find great major changes in our region, in our countries, in the whole world will be happening. Before we go and talk about the treatment, let me make an appeal, appeal to all of you that we should be dealing with the victims of Corona, the affected and the infected individuals with dignity and uh, respect. Don't treat them as they are just a dirt. I don't like to say the other word, which is started with SH. Don't treat them like SH word or a dirt because they are suffering from five diseases. 
First disease, which is organic disease, which is affecting their lungs and their body and consuming their power. Second, this is psychological because they are unable to deal with others while they have the virus infection because they are scared to infect them. Third, this is, is actually economical because they become unable to earn their money despite the fact they are young people. Number four, social illness, because they cannot communicate with anybody, relatives, neighbors, even sons and daughters and wives as well. Number five is the feelings disease, feelings, and from inside, feelings, feelings disease, okay, which led them to feel that they are a burden on other people, and they are young people still. So when we look at this, we find, unfortunately, in certain countries, very bad behavior from certain people. Let me take you to show you one or two examples of this. In one village, in one country, a woman died because of Corona, and they want to bring her back to be buried in her village. The village people came out refusing. This reflects ignorance. This reflects narrow-mindedness. This reflects their stupidity. At the end of the day, the authority interfered and they managed to let her to be buried. In another city, two people or three people were affected as positive uh, uh, corona victims. And when they were coming back to their building, to their flat, they were prevented by the other tenants because they did not want them to come to the building to affect the whole building. Stupidity, ignorance, narrow-mindedness. The third example which I can give is in certain uh, building or residential uh, uh, area, the resident in the, in, in, the, in the building were actually telling the supermarket and the restaurant not to come to this flat because they are affected by corona. This reflects ignorance, stupidity, and narrow-mindedness. Just trying to raise this because this happened in some of these countries without mentioning the name of such countries. Let us talk about now point number nine, which is what is the solution? Two point solution. Point number one is talking about 10 steps solution. Point number two, which is talking about the striking bottom line measures solution, nine points. Let us go through the solution because we talked about uh, challenges, talks about problems, talk about all this dark, but now we need to find the solution for this problem. Point number one is the solution in the first group is we have to treat our places of worship with respect, making them to be equal to other institution. No difference. Number two, we have to respect the feeling of Muslims and the respect of the uh, ritual, uh, ritual and, and actually places of worship as well. And don't put them under focus or under the spotlight. Number three is actually open the space for calling people to, or da'wah, okay? To raise the awareness, awareness amongst all the population in the city especially when you allow a very credible organization such as Al-Azhar University to take the lead in that. Number four, stop, stop making jokes about Islam as religion. Stop those TV presenters making mockeries about Islam and Muslims and their religion. Number five, trying to bring different kind of scholars to try to make a dialogue with those people. It now is a monologue, and you need to get a dialogue happening between this group and this group as well. Number six, invest in young people. Program for young people, no doubt about it. If we talk about Muslim populated countries, 50 to 60 percent of the population are made out of young generation. Number seven, we have to gear 
ourselves towards facing the economical crisis which will be affecting our countries post corona or during corona number 7 we have to pressurize the government to spend more on social services especially 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 health services and we have to respect doctors nurses technician and workers in the medical field Number nine, nine, we have to raise the social awareness, which you have to be all of us, whether we are actually a government institution, state institution, religious institution, civil society institution, uh, uh, universities, uh, research institution, and so on. So, and all of us should be focusing to raise the public awareness in, in, the, in the country. Number 10, and not the least one, is to establish the rule of law through good government good governance in our organization based on transparency 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 accountability advocacy cooperation communication networking uh, neutrality uh, reviewing and so on so on so on so and make the rule of law to govern everybody to govern everybody and nobody should be above the law or above the, the, the rule of law let me ask you brothers and sisters colleagues two stupid questions I'm always putting stupid questions on the table for each one every one of you did corona and was invented was corona invented to fight the religion of Islam and the followers of the Muslim religion stupid question might need an answer or no answer but you ask yourself that as well did corona came to fight terrorism and the extremism and violence or corona through these arbitrary stupid measures made by the so-called religious authorities in certain countries will lead to extremism, radicalism, and so on. This is the very standpoint of our immediate solution to how to deal with COVID-19 as we speak. The second group, which is nine point, which is talk about uh, striking bottom line measures striking bottom line measures we should take strategic direction that we need to take first one we need to invest heavily we need to invest heavily we need to invest heavily in what in education 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 different kinds of education education uh, state education which is traditional state education is traditional and vocational education, skills education, manual education, talent education, applied education, and social education connected to the climate around us and to the greater community, as well as the applied com 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 uh, the education which is based on applied experience. This is education to be the first one which you should invest uh, in it in the long term actually striking bottom line measures number two is finding is finding new job opportunity for the people or creating new job opportunity for the people and this has got four smaller points Point number one, making what we call community market. Community market to allow the low income or the no income to be able to have an income from coming to such a community market and to such community market and to earn their living. This is number one in providing job opportunity. Number two, to encourage, to encourage uh, the people, the skilled people are the manual worker to earn their living. 
Number three, to invest in small agriculture, small scale agriculture product on the scale of the flat, the roof, of the balcony, or whatever you call it in your area. Or even to hire a smaller place in a, in a park where you can actually uh, produce some uh, crops or some thing and sell it outside. Number four, in job opportunity, actually investing in animal breeding or fattening and so on, on the individual basis, on the level of the family as well. This is when we look at the smallest, the smaller scale project that the people need to have and to enable them to earn their living. If education, number one, different kind of education, five or six kind of education, then creating job opportunities or making people to uh, earn their living on a very small scale. Point number three in this uh, striking bottom line measures is invest, 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 invest in your research, whether it's scientific research or other kind of research. Without research, we get nowhere. Education, job opportunity, the research. Number four, invest in technology. Different kind of technology, and especially the information technology. With the information technology to control the information that we are receiving. Because some of such information could be lying to us, could be deceiving us, could be wrong information. This is number four. Number five, which has to need to change the doctrine of whom? Of security and military. Security doctrine should be focusing on fighting the crimes in the society to protect the individual, to protect the individual citizen. So it's for the interest of the citizen itself, not only the government, not only the state. The second doctrine we need to change is the military doctrine which it need to be geared towards protecting our country, our nation, and our citizens as well. So both doctrine for the military as well as for the uh, security has to focus on the welfare of the citizens of the country, the well-being of the state, the well-being of our society, the well-being of our community. This is point number five. Point number six, to establish, as I mentioned before, the role of law, particularly the principles of equality and fairness. There is no, amongst us, there is no slaves and masters. No first class and second class, third class and fourth class. No black, no white, no red, no yellow, no tall, no short, no fat, no skinny, nothing. We are all we are all equal before the law. We are all equal before the law. Number seven in our striking bottom line measures is to maintain, to maintain, to maintain the civil liberty space, civil liberty space. Without freedom and without civil liberty, there is no innovation. There is no motivation. There is no pioneering. No innovation, no motivation, no pioneering. If you treat your citizens as they are prisoners in a camp and you control the camp by security, you get nothing out of the millions and millions and millions of people inside your society. This is point number seven in the striking bottom line measures. Point number eight, we have to build stronger, stronger, and effective civil society sector and civil society organization to act as a watchdog, as a watchdog on the government on one side, as well as on the business on the side and prevent the bad relationship which is happening quite often between the government and the, uh, the government and the private business. Number nine, which is the last point, is uh, we need to invest again to invest again, to invest again in youth, young people, in the two solution steps, 
the first group, which is the 10 points, and the second group, which is the nine point, young people came to be the main factor of the future of these countries or our countries. Okay. So after measuring, after, me after mentioning all these solutions, all these solutions will lead us, will let us to deal with any pandemic, with any epidemic, with any challenge, actually, with social solution, social solution which will be based on a system, on a process, on a path, not on an individual, emotional, haphazardly, reactionary, conflicting solution. Sometime your leader could say that tomorrow I would like to do this. No. No, no, you have to go through a process of processing the information to change sense, so to change such processing of information into a system within the state, into a system within the system, as we call it in Arabic, Nizam, Masira, Walaysa, Hulul, Fardiya, Infaaliya, Ashwaiya, Mutakhabbita, Mutadariba. This was my interaction with you today. I thank you very much for being patient to listen to me over the last maybe 40 minutes or so. And uh, let me uh, finalize the first nine points of the discussion which I mentioned earlier on. Point number one is, is Corona is a pandemic? Point number two is COVID-19 and the relationship between COVID-19 and the hunger. Uh, COVID, and point number three, will we be hit by another COVID-19 attack by autumn? Uh, point number four, are we ready uh, for this attack or not? Point number five, why all these panic attacks from COVID-19 and there is no such panic attack from hunger and other killer diseases? Uh, point number six, how, how much some of those so-called Muslim religious authority dealt with COVID-19 in a very bad way and in a very arbitrary way. And number seven is what are the impacts of these arbitrary measures on the social divide in the community, especially by the so-called Muslim leader in Muslim majority countries. Number eight, the philosophy of Princess Aziza. Number nine, the solution. I thank you very much for being patient and uh, trying to uh, be patient with me. And see you inshallah next week in another talk. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.